Okay, salamu alaikum, uh, bonjour, and welcome to ASM's PTO-sponsored masterclass uh, featuring Dr. Vijay Kumar of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. You know, it, it's so lovely to see uh, faculty, staff, parents, board members, uh, and other distinguished guests here uh, today. I almost don't even recognize anyone because it's the first time I've actually seen your faces. <laughs> um, when a community comes together around a, around a shared purpose, uh, we have a mission. And uh, our mission at ASM really is about people, passion, and purpose, where everybody belongs, everybody engages, and everybody inspires. And here we are broadcasting live from the beautiful home of the Kadiris, and Mrs. Kadiri, of course, uh, our PTO president. She really represents, um, for me, what can happen uh, when you have positive leadership coming together, working closely with the school administration uh, in advancing the school mission and the vision of preparing global leaders for purposeful impact in their pursuits. Uh, with no further ado, I would like to introduce our wonderful PTO president, Mrs. Pretty Paul Kadiri. Thank you, Dr. Asato, for those kind words of introduction. I'm thrilled today to welcome, for our first masterclass of the season, Dr. Vijay Kumar from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, USA. Um, welcome. Um, and today we have Dr. Kumar um, going to be talking to us about um, his passions, his vision, his life story, um, the MIT intervention in Marrakesh at the ASM um, and what it means, not just in terms of education, but also in terms of relations and connections and cultural exchanges. I think it's the first time yes, that um, mm -hmm. uh, MIT has come to um, yeah. Morocco at a school level, um, so we are delighted with that. Um, he's also going to tell us about the, because he wears many hats at MIT, um, and I'm going to give you his full uh, introduction in a few minutes. Um, tell us what about the future of learning. We have today an interesting community here of uh, lots of parents, uh, teachers, educators, kids, um, and um, of course board members, um, and the US Consul General uh, to uh, Morocco, Laurence uh, Randolph. So I think that it would be very nice if at the end of the conversation we have a few takeaways um, you know, even as a parent, um, or as a child, or as an educator, um, you've had a vast experience, um, so it would be nice for us to have a few takeaways um, from that. If I may, I would like to just read what um, the master class is. It's faci facilitated by the ASM Parent Teacher Organization. The master classes offer immersive, I think I need my glasses. <laughs> experiences that give the community opportunities to meet with the world's leading practitioners in a variety of fields like art, science, technology, sports, music, food, um, and a bunch of other things. And each masterclass is led by a master, a great expert, a guest expert, and designed to offer in-depth yet accessible <laughs> knowledge. The participants get to interact with masters through virtual, or face-to-face -face interactions. Um, the session is being broadcast live through Facebook and also for our younger community across the world through YouTube. Um, so if you don't have a chance, I mean there are lots of kids in school who are not here and teachers who can't come just now because they're teaching. Um, and then we have a large ASM community around the world and an MIT community and a JWell community where this will be broadcast and available to view uh, later on. So whether your favorite trending passion is cooking, music, art, science, or technology, there's always something to learn for everybody at ASM PTO's masterclasses. So a little bit about Dr. Kumar. Um, Dr. Kumar is from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he is, um, he is the head executive director of MIT's JWell program, and you're gonna tell us a little bit more about that as we go along. And he's also Associate Director for Open Learning at MIT. Dean. Dean, Associate Dean. Mm -hmm. um, Claudia, who's joining us here from, uh, Dr. Claudia Riaz, Associate Director of JWell as well. 
for PK to 12 education, and she's been working with our kids so that the, by the end of this week, every ASM kid, which is 365, will have... Of the year. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> every kid will be touched by an, AS, uh, by an MIT education, uh, which is hands-on learning, project-based, uh, technology-based, sustainable. Um, and you're going to talk a little bit about what that means uh, for us. So Dr. Kumar provides leadership for sustainable not technology enabled education innovation at MIT. He is a member of MIT's Open Courseware Advisory Committee and Executive Director for MIT's Council on Educational Top Technology and a member of the Steering Committee for iCampus, which is an alliance between MIT and Microsoft. In prior roles at MIT and other institutions, Vijay has been responsible for strategy development and the integration of tech, media services into education. His research and advising work has included, to be honest, his accomplishments just go on for pages and pages, at least 10 pages, so this is just a summary. <laughs> And it's hard enough. Um, <laughs> engagements with the Smithsonian, the in India National Knowledge Commission, UNESCO, Open University of Catalonia, Singapore University of Technology and Design, and more recently with the Qatar Foundation International, mm -hmm. and the Massachusetts STEM Council's Network Operations Board. Mm -hmm. Vijay has authored numerous articles in the area of education innovations and technology strategy, and is co-editor of the Carnegie Foundation book, Opening Up Education, published by the MIT Press in August 2008. In 2013, he was awarded an honorary professorship by Tianjin Open University. He was also named the Exxon Mobil Chair for Technology-Enabled Learning at the University of Qatar, and the list goes on. Um, so welcome, it's a pleasure to have you. I would also like to thank our distinguished guest, uh, U.S. Consul General for actually um, abandoning the Secretary of State <laughs> <laughs> and arriving for an event which ASM is hosting. And so I thank you very much for taking the time out from your very busy schedule. So over to you, Dr. Kumar. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Greetings. Um, Adab, salam alaikum, namaste, sabah uh, It is just an immense pleasure, a privilege to be here with folks. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Preeti, uh, Mr. Kadiri, for your hospitality, for welcoming us over here, and uh, uh, the Consul General for making his presence over here, and you, distinguished parents, uh, members of the school. Uh, for us, uh, we are just, Claudia, the team, our team from MIT, from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, for us, this is a very, very important activity in collaborating uh, with the American School of Marrakesh uh, in this activity, which, you know, when you look at some of the simple things, it might be saying, oh, we are doing STEM education in maker spaces. Uh, just like the line uh, about it's a small step uh, and the giant leap for mankind, you know, we think this is a very, very important step in shaping the future of education, not only at the school, but for the region, you know, for the children of the region. And uh, there's a lot of talk about the future, and we'll talk about it. Uh, this, uh, the fact that people have been, have been listening to some stories and talking uh, to the board, the fact that you have come to this stage and uh, through Preeti's efforts engaged in this uh, collaboration speaks volumes about the intent, the purposefulness of this initiative, you know, and we are extremely uh, thrilled to be part of it in helping shape this activity. Uh, you said, you know, uh, he, uh, that Vijay is going to talk about his life. I will warn you that the extended version will be on Netflix as a series. <laughs> so you might be looking, looking out uh, for that. But uh, uh, what, I, what I'd like to do is say a little bit about myself. It's more in the, uh, about context setting. I've had some, the opportunity just over the uh, 
uh, last two days of sharing some of my uh, past, uh, my preparation, my past with uh, Preeti and hearing about her own impressive efforts in making change around the world. But I want to talk, say a little few things that will set the context. They'll at least, uh, as I say, show my bias you know, uh, when, in the comments that you see and some of my academic preparation, but they will uh, hopefully surface some things that I think are very, very uh, uh, important. And, uh, uh, I, you know, this is an interesting time in the afternoon, and I hope that in my comments uh, I will energize you and not lull you to sleep. That's, uh, you know, which, which is always the desire and hope of everyone who talks after one o'clock. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> and I can tell you stories about that. So basically, you know, uh, they, you know, when you look at my background and stuff, and I like to say, well, you know, I'm a chemical engineer. Uh, then I did my master's. It, this is from an institute, the Indian Institute of Technology in Madras. And I won't talk my, about my schools, multiple schools. We were talking about that uh, in India. But uh, chemical engineering, then I did my MS, my master's as a research program in industrial management, and then proceeded uh, you know, and th there was a bunch of things I did in the middle, and then I came to do my doctoral work in future studies in education. Now, I want to tell you uh, that I'm not laying the, all these out to tell, look, I got all these degrees, you know. But there's a purpose because they represent some interesting things that I hope we will be able to carry forward as we talk about the learners of today. And the learners of today, as we were talking earlier on, are not just the seven-year-olds or the 17-year-olds, but could be the 70-year-olds too. You know? And don't look at me. <laughs> so, and so when I was doing chemical engineering, and you have to realize that uh, a large part of that degree, you know, and this is a tough institution to get to, but in the last semester, we all did a project. 18 credits, it could be a make or break, right? Uh, at that time, the IBM 370 came into campus. It was a big deal, right? And about 11 of us decided not to do a project in chemical engineering directly, but sort of negotiated so that we could work with this magic machine, the IBM 370. And it opened up a world. There was, you know, there were these programs, you could do planning, you could, you know, the, all these software packages, this is my card, you know, you could, and then we, we would make some, we were smart people, but we could make some gratuitous connections to chemical engineering so that when we defended it, we could say, why we did that? But we did that, and there's an important message as the, to the fact that we were allowed to do that, and this is a message for a lot of us who are teachers. Uh, industrial management, MS, you know, it's a lot of, I was doing a lot of operations research, quantitative techniques, and uh, I argued, I told my advisor, and I have to tell you, I'm, I'm coming from India, I was telling, I just came from uh, Hyderabad and Chennai, and Chennai I went to visit my master's advisor, you know, and you know, in India we go and we touch their feet and things like this, this is the MS advisor, I went to thank him because I, he sort of turned the ship for me, you know, because the things that he got me started doing is why I'm doing what I'm doing, and I have this immense privilege of being at a place like this, working at the Jamil World Education Lab, working at MIT, uh, which unabashedly makes change around the world in terms of education. Right? So uh, what he did, so I said, look, you know, quantitative techniques, OR, I don't want to just figure out how many more gaskets to produce through OR. You know? I think these techniques can be applicable for educational planning because God knows we do an awful job with that, you know, resource requirements prediction. So he said, sure, go forth and do it. He helped me argue with the, the bureaucracy, you know, so that they could give me data so that I could demonstrate how you could apply these techniques for resource pl planning for students or their OR techniques. And you know, there was some good amount of modeling and stuff involved. Third story, then we started, you know, I was telling uh, uh, Preeti yesterday, starting a consulting cooperative, doing some documentaries and this thing, but I got introduced by a person who was quite a thought leader amongst us. And he says, you know, Vijay, you keep talking about education and the future and planning. You should go to the USIS, in the, you know, and which was a big deal in India. I went to the, and he says there's a magazine there called, uh, called uh, from the World Future Society, called Futures. So I went there and started reading it, and I drank it up. 
you know, it was all this stuff. And along there was this thing which said that there was about uh, the future studies program, right? So I said, I want to go do my PhD in this program. Now I have to tell you, there were only two programs in the United States at that time where future studies was not part of a management or a business school. One was at UMass Amherst, and we had Toffler, Bucky Fuller, and all in the board. I mean, you can think about you know, the, the folks. And the other was in, a play, in Minnesota. It was called the Social Philosophical Foundations of Education. Now, and I had it up to here with quantitative techniques. I, you know, because the kinds of schools, and you know, most of you are familiar in places like India, there's so much focus on quantitative techniques, science, STEM. And I wanted to do the soft side of planning. So I came here. And I mentioned that because I came into education technology and educational planning, not as a technologist, but as someone who was thinking about the future of education. And initially, the first one and a half years, but on sexism and feminism and racism and social structures in education. It was studying Freud, it was studying Marx. It was, I hosted Dick Gregory for the World Future Society Conference over there. But it was, and then you say, oh my God. Then I would go to MIT, where Claudia's guru, you know, Seymour Papa, and all this stuff around Logo, uh, there were two pages around this language called Logo. I got the opportunity to go to Lesotho and work with elementary school kids over there to teach them uh, Logo and work with them. And, but my research work was on planning for introducing technological innovations for education in developing countries. So what's the takeaway from this, you know, and there are many more exciting parts of my story, but I'll just stick to these, more juicy parts, but that's why you watch the Netflix version. But this is, uh, the takeaways, you know, are the professor in chemical engineering who allowed me to stick my neck out and say, go and do the project over there, that's okay, right? The professor, my advisor, uh, Ramani, whom I met just now, who said, yeah, go, here are the opportunities for you. Go do the stuff that you want to do with education. Uh, the takeaway was that I came to a program, the Future Studies program. It was some amount of personal risk taking because it was not typically what people who went to IIT did, you know. But you say, I can take this risk because I want to uh, learn about this. And you also got introduced, and then this fellow, Ratin Roy, who said, go read these magazines, and that's the significance of mentors. You know, in our life, in our lives, we have, our kids have mentors. Most of my mentors didn't even know they were my mentors, you know, but they offered advice, they offered guidance freely. And, and so this allowing people to stick their necks out, taking that risk, and then being open to possibilities is the big takeaway messages, you know. And this is what I sort of said, you know, like, uh, and so this thing about risk taking, you know, you're studying foundational stuff in engineering. I tell a lot of people who ask me for advice, you know, chemical engineering I want to do, mechanical engineering, I say, look, most of undergraduate education, it's about foundational preparation, you know. I mean, you're looking at an architect, an urban planner. It's all about foundational preparation because you don't know where, what paths are going to emerge, but you want to be personally ready in order to, uh, to play with it. And what we do is, if you look at definitions of innovations as different from invention, okay, innovations are up taking some ideas that you have. They don't have to be new ideas but you come up with new applications. You take your foundational learning, and so I can, I can take quantitative techniques and apply it to education, rather than drilling out gaskets. So the personal innovation characteristics that you have is what we try to cultivate, and you'll see that in a lot of the programs, mentors matter, and all the time what we're trying to do is generate insight, a, the passion to move forward, to innovate, to take risks, and what we're trying to do is create capabilities and readiness in order that you can actually engage in this change. You know? And so that you can constantly be alert to the possibilities around. And this is something that you'll keep on hearing me repeat. Alert to the possibilities, not just, oh my God, the world is going there, I have to respond. But to go proactively influence where the world can go. So this is what we want amongst our children, not say, you know, the world is being beset with technology, you know, how can I pick up skills? You want to change the direction of those things, you know, where it goes. So that's what we try to cultivate. 
the, the, the thing that I, the last point that I want to make, one of the things that I learned from uh, my three months when I was doing the field study, which led to my doctoral work, you know, in introducing technological innovations for developing countries for education, was becoming aware that when you looked at technology, the, you know, the capabilities, the features, the affordances that technology provided, it was just the first step. In order for that to accomplish what it set out to do is a very systemic problem. In my case, you, I had, it didn't matter that the kids picked up logo, or we used to use this thing that Texas Instruments had called speak and spell and speak and math for reading English and reading writing, that the scores improved. As long as we were there shelling out money, you know, USA, it was a USAID project. In fact, in the hotel that I stayed, every developmental agency in the world was there. You know, they were all doing projects over there. Because when we left, would they still be there? Would there be even roads and infrastructure to move the batteries that were, new, that were needed for these things? More importantly, were the, did the teachers like it? The, did the teachers feel confident using it? Did the administrators like it? So all the, the systemic readiness becomes a very, very critical part you know, of the risk. And you see this, in, I mean, just in the preparation that these folks have done to, to so your school has done, you know, in order to move this forward is just remarkable, and it's going to it's going to reflect itself in many ways. You know, the space for the maker spaces that they're making, the preparation. You know, what are the education models? It's going to be multitudinal considerations. You know, in order to move this in any constructive way. So, uh, let me go to now. What I'd like to do is really share some. You know, I'll take some characteristics, some vignettes of what I said is a preferred vision. If you, if you saw the title, you know, we talked about envisioning the future of education. So what does this future landscape, what could it look like, what does it look like? Just some assorted, it's a hodgepodge of vignettes, you know, vignettes, projects that I'm familiar with from the MIT context elsewhere that I want to share and draw out some of the learnings from that. And I will tell you, this is not just, it is across the spectrum. It's from K through 12 education. It's from higher education. It's the kinds of things that over the last uh, uh, eight years we have been aggressively pursuing at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And uh, uh, in order to, uh, you know, there's this thing, you know, charity begins at home. You know, things that we have been innovating with upon ourselves so that we can share it with the world, you know. So, uh, uh, so here's something, some years ago, uh, Claudia was running a planning session. You know, we have a big event that's actually going on right now called Connections, where our whole, the Jamil World Education Lab, and that's something I should mention. Uh, at MIT, I'm the executive director of the Jamil World Education Lab. You heard Preeti's introduction. Um, uh, Claudia uh, is the associate director for pre-K through 12. I have my colleagues, uh, Kirky and uh, Joe and Emily. You know, we all represent that unit. And through the largest of Mohammed Jamil, we've been able to launch this effort. And if you didn't notice a small byline in that opening screen, and I can quickly flip back, it says, sparking a global renaissance for education for, education for all learners. That is our mission, right? And, the, and each of the terms, the renaissance has meaning. We want to be transformational. We want to spark, because you do the work. We spark. You run the engine, right? And all learners matters. It is not just about a particular, and th this is a tough problem in education because we talk about equity and access and we take the same thing and we think that having a multiplicative factor on the same thing means access and all. Scale, I like to point out, is not just multiplicative. Scale in mathematical language is a vector. You have to do many different kinds of things for many different kinds of audiences. Then you achieve scale. Not just taking, not the, the old Henry Ford, Ford model, you know, you can have any color, right? So, uh, Claudia was running this session, and we were, and my, Angie Belcher is a professor, uh, you know, at MIT, very innovative professor, and she and I had thought about a project that we would do with NASA. You know, NASA does a lot of K through 12 education. And we brought this project up in the session that Claudia was running when she was help facilitating some discussion on collaborative education, collaborative learning. And said, so imagine 
that there are all these schools around the US, around the world, you know. What if these kids got together and now we have networks, etc., and they all create the payload for the next mission to Mars? You know, they collect artifacts, they're things, and if you look at it, it's it's a non-trivial exercise, you know, because it means that they have to, you know, you can't have everything that you can send to Mars, you have to be limited, so you have to discreetly select what is it that I pick that will reflect our society, our world, to that Martian up there, you know. You might even have to imagine what does that Martian care for, because our view might be just eat, go home, right? But there might be other kinds of things. So how might I pick the things, artifacts that I have to select, how might I test them, you know, their properties, so that I can give some description, have some, uh, as I say, metadata, so that this foreign person, alien person out there, I can give some clues as to what they're looking at, you know, so that they don't pick up a rock and try to bite it. I can say there's a rock, this is not, you know. I mean, some things, some, so how might I describe it, how might I measure its properties, physical properties, chemical properties, and then, how do I make a decision? Because you know how we are as children. I say, oh, no, I want this stuff to go. And you say, no, I want this stuff to go. I have to negotiate. I have to argue. And then we have to collectively come through a process and say, I, we think that this will be the best thing to send. So it's about not just doing the science, math, the properties, but also negotiation, collaboration, right? So you want to think. And then somebody, when we are proposing this, said, oh, our children, uh, you know, they can't, uh, I mean, they talk about food, clothing, and shelter. Uh, this think about Mars and all is too much. I said, that's not yours to decide. Because we always, we do all this as parents, right? We want our children to be happy, but we want them to be happy exactly the way we want them to be happy, right? So, so I mean, so the, the thing is that we really want to see, uh, you know, because their imagination, you know, what, where does it go? So I want to point this out as a scenario, and this is the kind of thing that we want our children at ASM everywhere. You know? Imagine the possibilities, constructive. So designing a learning experience which draws out these kinds of outcomes, collaboration, thinking, all that becomes interesting, and particularly if you set a goal that is larger than life. You know, because you want to spark their imagination. So this is one we need, you know, and you, you see all, and it was wonderful because the discussion got so rich, I don't know if you remember, Claudia, because we would talk about, you know, the kids from, will be all, from all over the world, so maybe we should have automatic translators built in so that when they're talking, you know, all that happens. So it's, it's a simple vision, but it has lots of complex implications for learning. You know? uh, uh, there are uh, wonderful examples like that. This uh, I would like uh, like to uh, this you know uh, again I'm, I'm pointing I keep pointing to Claudia and these folks we've been the steam labs you know we, we've been doing for steam for those of you you know who might not be familiar with the it is speak you know you, you talk about science technology engineering math and uh, STEAM is when people said, look, there's an A art component in this also. But you have these workshops, labs, sort of like the kinds of activity we're doing that. But if you see, see this, this was a scratch session. I was uh, talking to uh, Preeti's younger one who was talking about you know, the kinds of things that uh, he does with scratch. It's a, it's a language that millions of kids use on mobile phones, on devices to see. Many of your parents might have seen this with your kids. You know, I want to point out the latter part of the statement over there. So this is a scratch-based exercise, and I'm going to keep on picking, and I, in a true didactic teacher kind, I'm going to keep on pointing this to you till you say, I got it, okay? So we are saying we are designing a series of experiences to gain comfort with exploring, problem solving, expressing their ideas creatively with coding. Notice problem solving, exploring, right? Now come to another exercise. This is a kind of stuff that uh, my colleague uh, Joe out there does. You know, this is you know some fun exercise we think rocket modules, etc. Now and there are it, it teach certain concepts in physics, Newton's third law, and so on. But the point that I want to highlight is the la latter part, which says by the end of the activity, the students involved will understand the importance of the iterative process of design. You make, break, you fail, succeed, you do. The importance of fail fast and the cool and fun outcomes you get when you keep improving on a design. 
So it's not about the technology. It's certainly you pick up the domain knowledge, etc. It is about getting comfortable with that kind of problem-solving approach. Because guess what? As we all know, that is how life works. That's how real problems work, right? So uh, th that's one thing. Now, this is similarly a course that this wonderful person called Kyle at MIT uh, runs. It's to design video games with undergrad students. It's a terrific thing, you know. And uh, uh, and again, over here, they're designing games, but it's, uh, and if you talk to, Kyle was interviewed for, uh, for the MIT News, you know, and it was just wonderful listening to him talk, because what he was talking about was not technology, and they're designing games, which, which is a big deal, but he really kept on talking about, look, this is really about creating confidence, the behavior modeling, the emotional intelligence, how people respond to other people's ideas, that it's positive education techniques to create a kinder, bolder, effective learning experience. That's the enduring capability that you will create, right? So these are boot camps. The boot camps are something that we do from open learning at MIT. We're doing it in a variety of places. In fact, we're planning one in, the, uh, in Saudi Arabia. We've done it with the World Health Organization. These are places where they are intensive, on-site experiences where people design equipment, design technology, design software. And, uh, but if you look at the goals, you say, look, by the end of the week, teams will identify a key challenge to solve. So there's one point. They solve real problems. They create real devices, real technology. And this is a boot camp on deep technology, right? So uh, it is, uh, you know, uh, there's considerable technical acumen that is required and certainly that will be uh, you know, derived from that experience. But here, it's not just to build the devices, but they come up with associated business models and present their solutions and receive specific and ac actionable feedback. So they're actually going to do this. They're going to become entrepreneurs. They're going, this is going to be a step in their entrepreneurial activity. That's the outcome. And when we did a, 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 a feedback session with the folks, in the, look at, and I've highlighted some of these things, an overwhelming majority, 94 of the survey respondents, felt that the boot camp trained them to effectively identify problems, employ systematic approaches to develop innovative solutions. They're not talking about the granular technology that they got this, you know. What they really picked up, what they really abstracted. And th these are, this is people writing about their own experiences and this is the feedback that they got. And then they said, look, it helped me communicate better and develop better collaborative skills because these people who are going, to, these are folks who are not only undergraduate students and graduate students, they're actual entrepreneurs or to be wannabe entrepreneurs are coming here. And they all know that if you have to launch if you have to be an entrepreneur, if you have to launch a company, if you have to take an idea and take it to fruition as an enterprise, it is going to require all these kinds of competencies. And the technical competency is merely a starter kit. It's all this other stuff that you do with the negotiation, et cetera, that is going to take it from here to there, right? So this I, I'll keep on driving on. This, uh, uh, what I'm showing you here is now uh, our colleague George Westerman, who heads uh, uh, workforce learning at the Jamil World Education Lab, uh, he wrote a piece on what the chief learning officer, you know, all many organizations are the chief learning officer who's in charge of training, etc. And when he interviewed, and this is a paper that he published in the Harvard Business Review, uh, he says, this is the thing that's happening, how people are looking differently at the kinds of competencies and skills that they need. And it's very telling. It's, the focus is on developing mindsets, tendencies that will allow them to be. It's excellent. Right? This is, and this is a very important thing because they say, look, you know, from developing skills to developing mindsets, you know. And I, I highlighted some of this. There are things that because this adopt, adapt smoothly in the future, this is about enduring capabilities that you create. You know? And that's what people want. So in the training that they provide, this becomes a very important dimension. And, and you know, so they want agility. They want people to be sort of strategic in their orientation. And so this is the chief learning officers. These are people who are in charge of developing training programs, educational programs in industry. So you see where I'm going with this about the focus, about the future, about the future of learning, right? About where the emphasis needs to be. So what's the reflection for me? 
I used to say in some presentations that word STEM, which is so heavily used, that STEM is a proxy term for all these tendencies, problem solving, active learning, negotiating, collaborating, identifying problems, communicating. So that what we are really after with all this, and this is not to uh, play down domain competencies, subject knowledge, right? But this is to say that that is a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition. In fact, these are very, very important. These enduring learning behaviors, outcomes that we want, you know, that's what you want. The other thing that I see in all these examples that I showed you, you know, when we talked about the deep uh, boot, uh, you know, deep tech boot camps, for instance, technical competency, yes, business competency. There's a high level of porosity you know, the boundarylessness between disciplines, between different kinds of things. Because if you, and uh, my, uh, there's a very senior colleague, uh, even I can call him senior, uh, Professor Larson at MIT, you know, who's uh, uh, very, very influential in launching a lot of our distance education efforts in the early days. He'll always say, you cannot solve any world problem with one discipline. Anything that is a real problem in the world requires multiple disciplines to come together. And that's becoming very, very clear right now. So uh, it, what we are seeing that in the kinds of, and this is very important for pre-K through 12 institutions also, how do you engage with industry? How do you engage with other actors with higher education in order to do this? This porosity, the boundarylessness, Okay, they become very, very important. So when you reflect, when I reflected on all these examples, even late last night, I was trying to look at different examples. Some of these are very late productions from last night. You know, I think, what, you know what, what's, what am I getting from all this? And that's what you're getting. So that's one kind of thing, which is who is the new learner now that we are trying to identify. And we see this. The new learner, our children, particularly at this thing, they are networked. They're on social media, they are on physical networks, they talk to each other, right? And as it is, they are very, very social, they're very, very collaborative. It was wonderful to see uh, yesterday, uh, you know, there were students at ASM who were working with these micro bits, working with, uh, with uh, uh, Kirky, Emily, and Joe. And I mean, just to watch that enterprise was fascinating, you know? Because they network, they, they even say, which one shall we do? What problem shall we do? How shall we share? They offer solutions to each other. So the learner of today is a network learner, okay? And we are and just one agent, one node in that network of learning, right? We as instructors, we are thinking, they are getting information, they are contacting people, so they have access to content, communities, people, right? And one of the challenges the network learner has to do is, particularly now, is that they are beset with an abundance of information, communities, and they say, how can I make sense of all this? How can I synthesize this? So the, they synthesize, they abstract, they do. And then creative thinking, critical thinking. But the point that I've highlighted over there, today's learner is a compassionate learner. And that's very important. And compassion is not sympathy. Empathy is not sympathy. It is finding yourself in the context of problems of the world, problems of the learner with society. And you know, uh, we had, in, our, in the Jamil World Education Lab, we gave out grants to our faculty to do. It is one, one of the uh, grants that was uh, given through uh, pre-K through 12. Uh, the faculty member came to us, uh, Pavan Sina, who runs a wonderful initiative for blind children. And he says, you know, Claudia, you know, Vijay, this uh, projects that Jabal does, you know, are very interesting because they're connected. We know we insist that in the grants it has implications for the world outside. So infusing that kind of relevance in education is very, very important for the mental wellness of children. And you know, we might connect it to the to a mental wellness initiative because and so uh, when and I have talked to MIT students uh, you know, when we were launching all these digital learning efforts, my colleague Hal Abelson and I went to every dormitory and talk to the students dinner time. And we have a program called D-Lab, right, where students do development projects. Some very, very interesting projects. There's one project, for instance, where they built uh, rickshaw-based ambulances. Now, you have to say, rickshaw-based, sounds cute. It's not, but a rickshaw, is, a rickshaw-based ambulance is not just something that takes people from point A to point B. 
It's an ambulance. So it has to have dampening, it has to have comfort, it was bi-directional, it had engineering implications, design implications, right? But it was relevant. In fact, the WHO bought those uh, uh, rickshaws from MIT students, right? It, but it was relevant, and they, what the students told me when we said, said we get more out of that from, than from many classes, the fact that we do relevant projects, because they connect with projects, they connect with humanity outside, with people, with problems that they see that are contextual and real to them, right? It's, so that's the notion of compassion and empathy that you're actually connected in a society and to think about those kinds of dimensions when you talk about curricula, when you talk about programs, right? Then you say, in light of all this, who is the new teacher? And you will see that I'm slowly moving us into this digital world that we live, right? So. In my mind, and there was a project that we did, my col uh, colleague, uh, Karen Wilcox, she's a professor of aeronautics. Uh, sadly, she's not at MIT anymore. She went to start a very big research lab at the University of Texas in Austin, right? Uh, Karen, uh, uh, so this project was funded by the Department of Education, and she's a professor of aeronautics, so it's not surprising that it was called fly-by-wire. Fly-by-wire refers to the fact that, you know, most planes nowadays fly themselves. You, know, you sit there, they're landing themselves, etc. But the analogy over here is that when the new teacher, the modern day teacher I will offer is like a modern day pilot, okay? A modern day pilot gets lots of data, data on the weather, data on runway conditions, God forbid data on the passengers behind. I mean, you know, all kinds of data they're getting, right? And what uh, they have to do, and they have lots of technology on hand, you know, devices, this thing, and what they have to do is interpret all this data that's coming, right, and negotiate and navigate the plane, land the plane successfully under diverse weather conditions, right? So data, interpret data, make decisions, use technology, Right? Uh, use what knowledge, and when you say navigate the landing, e each student is different weather conditions because they learn differently, they're differently motivated, they have different aspirations, right? And uh, to be able to make sure that they succeed, you know. So our vision of the new teacher in this world is like a modern day pilot, you know, because these are the things that they do formative testing, you'll hear analytics, people, you know, do all these programs. So how do I take all this and bring it down? And some of these things we'll see. So why do we have to do this, right? What is, what's the urge over here? And this, that I'm, this, the world that we confront, you know, is we have a lot of change. And this is a truism. It's a tired old line. But we have so much change going on around us. And the change is to a large extent driven by technology in the workplace, which is demanding new skills, new competencies, and it is also driven by a lot of social political forces. You know, people are leaving. We do a lot of work with the refugees in Jordan. You know, Claudia and I do a project with Save the Children for, you know, for teacher training over there. There's displaced learners, people going across for different reasons. Today it's for social political reasons, tomorrow it's for climate change, day after tomorrow it's because markets are moved, Right? And how do you provide education? So the change is manifest through a, a lot through technology. You know, I point to Uber. You know, Uber is, you'd like to think it's a transportation service. It's actually a software service, right? Uber fails when software runs out. And it's, I can't get connection, you know? <laughs> and they take you to all kinds of places because the satellite is telling, giving it wrong information. <laughs> so that's, that's Uber for you. Look at that. There's a picture over there. The, uh, that's an earbud which is offering translation, right? In real time. So this technology, in fact, I have a colleague who just painted it so perfectly for me. He says, Vijay, when we studied geography, it was an atlas, you know, the, the map, we looked at geography, which became a million images on Google Earth, which became an intelligent software service on my watch. So think of this. Every hard product is being transformed into an intelligent soft service. What are the implications for the skills that you need, the competencies, and by implication, 
for how we educate our children, what we educate our children on, what are the things, you know. And that's going to change. Today it's this, tomorrow it's going to be something else. That's the agility. So that's the demand factor. And I do want to make a very, very important point. You know? Uh, and this is, speaks to the proactiveness. I believe, you know, I mean, one of the things that we did in future school, in our education, we had a sign that said a futurist is not, in our world, a futurist was not about prediction. A futurist is one who makes future possibilities more real for others, right? We co-construct the future, you know? Now, some of the technology, so all this should not give you the, flavor that, oh my God, this thing, technology is happening upon us, we've got to scramble and do some stuff about it. No, sometimes we employ technology because we do better. We do old things in new ways, we're able to do new things in new ways, in different, more important ways. So, and the example over here, this is also from my colleague George Westerman's book uh, there, uh, Newport News, and I think I was telling you this episode uh, before uh, uh, Preeti. So this is a shipbuilding yard in Virginia, right? And they make all these things. And the people there, and I'll caricature this slightly, so, you know, they're going, and these guys, workers, they are screwing in metal plates, and they're welding these metal plates. If they make a mistake, they don't know all the implications it has, that, because downstream, it has got their productivity issues, there are failures down the thing, because it's doing damage down the, you know, down the chain. And they're doing all this, they, don't, they have no idea. More, and even more, they don't even know that they're working and building a ship. For them, they get up in the morning and they think, oh, I got to screw this plate in. I got to weld this plate, that's a job. Morale was down, morale was way down, failure rates were very high. So what they did was, they said, let's give these folks uh, these virtual reality glasses. So when they weld, they could see the layers it was affecting. They could see the rest of the production line. So if they, if they get, got it wrong, they could see the implications, so they could adjust it and do it, right? So then they also began to realize that they were building this mammoth vessel, a ship, whether it was a, a tanker or an aircraft carrier, and they said, wow, you know, I'm doing something important. Morale shot up, failure rates went down. So we proactively look for opportunities to employ technology and therefore pro provide capabilities and skills in different ways. Right? So this is something that I want to point out. So, and this is what, something that became very important. And so we have been talking about, at the Jamil World Education Lab, we've been talking about an open learning. We said, look, this, when I, BC is before COVID. We've been saying this from before COVID. We're saying, look, this is where the world's uh, going. We need to be uh, proactive about all this. Along comes uh, COVID, and all of this became critical because, and it became critical, but there's a watch there. It became, a lot of the stuff we were saying became critical because none of the old demand went away. But here, it also became, for learning continuity, for business continuity reasons, you have to move online, do things digital. And a caution for us was, when you have this opportunity, and this is something that I, that, you know, it's almost like a plea to all of you who are engaged as teachers, as parents, when you think about the future of education, it is not to take what you have, good or bad, and transplant it online. I mean, I can tell you cute stories over lunch, maybe, you know, about the disasters of doing that, you know, about cloning inadequacy, as they say, you know. So, so but you, you can, but they say this is an opportunity to move from transition to transformation, right? Just saying, instead of taking this, this is an opportunity. When we do MIT X courses, these are courses MIT courses that we put on the online platform. It is a re-engineering exercise. We rethink the courses. What can technology, what can this thing? Otherwise, it's a waste of time. You know, you're just going to put it out there. So, and we have, so, and we said, look, can we get to the people we were not able to get before, continuity inclusion? Can we get quality, can you get equity with using, leveraging technology in new ways? Because now we got to do it, right? So that's the thing. And when all that seems very, very daunting, we say, fear not. And this is the optimist in me talking, but I live amongst optimists and people who create futures. Say, look, on the supply side of this, you know, we've got some comforting factors. We've got digital technology, right? We've got digital learning innovation, which, and these terms, I really want you all to listen, to look at the generous definitions of these terms. When I say digital learning innovation, I'm not talking about technology alone. 
It, it is, uh, and it, not just online technology. You know, we are talking about virtual reality, we are talking about data-based uh, 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 affordances, all these things. And the other, things, the other thing that I want to point out is when I talk about digital learning innovation, this kind of digitally driven innovation is manifest across the life cycle of education. Courses are changed, credentials are changed, everything in between labs are changed, how you do assessment is changed, and that's how you look at digital learning, generously like that. This digital learning innovation is not just done as acute intervention, it is informed by what we are learning about learning, by learning science. A lot of things, some which have known for a hundred years, some which we are learning now, and I'll point to a couple of those things. And what digital actually allows us to do is to implement what we learn from learning science about how people learn, brain science, cognitive science, so that we can actually design courses and productions. For instance, a lecture is no longer a lecture. It's a six minute video segment on a concept. You know, when you look at online courses. And there's, it's that particular, whether it's six minutes or short video segments, is informed by what learning science tells about attention span, about learning curves, forgetting curves, about recall retention, and point to it. So it's all, and it, but we could not do that effectively and at scale the way we used to do it before. This allows us to implement what we learn to many more people than we could serve before. And then the other factor on the supply side, which we are very big on, I personally have been very involved in, is the open movement, right? MIT in 2000 launched the open courseware. The content of every course at MIT was published and made available to the world for free, okay? This was the open courseware, and you can go look at it. MIT also 2,500 courses, everything from uh, the syllabus, to the curriculum, to the assessments, all of that is published. Some people use the supplements, some people na provide navigatable paths uh, through that course. Uh, now, open itself has a much more generous definition. We have online courses. At that time, we said the only way to propagate MIT's value was, because we thought only, the only way to do it was through face-to-face -face onsite. We said we'll take a picture of it and publish and put it out there as open courseware. Fast forward to 2012, we said we've learned to think or two about online education. We'll do online courses and have interactive experiences. So you have MITx courses, the edX platform came, and so on, and we're learning more about how to use data. So the open moment is a large part of the change. So these are the comfort change inducing supply factors that allow us not to be overtly daunted by this force of change that we are surrounded by, right? So, this is what I meant. You have a six minute video segment, if you have a fuzzy concept, it's immediately out by, there's a visualization, you know, uh, Kirky out there helped generate many of these visualizations in a lab before uh, this thing. You can have a, you have a video segment, and immediately after that, there's a game-like environment where people can do some testing, play. These are what kids do online, right? So. If you think about, uh, uh, you know, a course, it's a six-minute six minute video segment, you're fuzzy on a concept, along pops a visualization. At that time, not as I had it six months later, if the lab was available, I need to understand it now. Did I get it? Let me do an exercise. You do this exercise to figure out whether you got it. That's the testing that happens. You know? So this is a new, this is when I say, you know, there's innovation across the, this thing, and I said the science of learning. Okay, we used to talk about uh, learning curves. Did you know there are forgetting curves, right? So, the, you know, and this is what brain science, cognitive science tells us, right? So I forgot. <laughs> so, and the, and, the, and the thing is, if you look at, I mean, I, these are all too, uh, a little dense, but there's a very important message over here, because you know how it is when we were learning, they say, learn this, learn this, learn this, you gotta do it again, learn it. Sometimes a joke, my father tried to teach me probability and statistics. All I saw was an angry guy yell at me. <laughs> so, <laughs> much later, my wife taught me, and I said, I, 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 I get some of this, you know. But the, the fact is that it is not, if it, this, this thing that you see over here is that when you do over here, the 
immediate recall from that is good. But downstream, when you look at uh, that are have feedback, that are interleaved, there are exercises that are done, the downstream recall is much better. That's improving, that that's a dark black line, whereas this is not. And we're not studying, nobody's, when you go into a job, it's not just about the stuff that you, you have to recall it later on because you have to apply it in different contexts. You know? And the, so with interleaved learning, with examples, even with meditation, with spacing the learning, with modularity, the recall is better, that's one thing. And how they put it, that the slope of that forgetting curve has become much more gentle. And that's, that's how, the, so, and all this is implemented when you have testing, interleaving, you can go do this stuff, you can go, come back, pick up the lesson. That's what you get in this newly re-engineered online, but 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 this kind of learning for this kind of subject. And that's what we try to bring. This is where we go with the future of education. I'm rapidly coming to a close. So where does this all, so when we talk about the new landscape of learning, right, what do we see? We see, uh, you know, uh, uh, virtual reality where people are in immersive environments, they're trying out experiments. We have look like things like blockchain technology where students can go anywhere but carry their credentials with them. They don't have to contact the registrar. We, thinks, uh, we look at AI-powered uh, uh, things where, uh, uh, you know, we look at virtual environments where people actually do lots of practice. Teachers can practice things. We look at uh, AI-based environments. This is one of our partners in, uh, in JWell. Uh, where we look at an AI-based platform which allows us to create different pathways, different courses through open courseware content. So depending on where you are in terms of preparation, and if you want to say, look, I want to uh, look at energy, uh, this, it'll say, here are some of the kinds of courses that you can take based on your current knowledge so that you can uh, you know, become an energy researcher or energy scientist. So these are the kinds of affordances that we bring. This last example, you know, we talk about a lot. This is a graduate, you know, we were talking about adult learners, right? Uh, the MicroMasters was a program that was launched a few years ago. And this is an example to illustrate the fact that when we talk about this innovation, it's not just about courses. It walks all the way up to credentials. A MicroMasters is a five course sequence, all online courses, all MIT courses. Anybody in the world can take these online courses, right? People who do well, some of them can, and, and there are some conditions, can opt to come and do one semester at, an, at MIT to get a terminal degree, a master's degree, if, you know, if it, in that area, if it exists, but it's not just MIT. We have about upwards of 54 institutions around the world who say you do those MicroMasters courses, do the one semester at my institution, we can give you the degree. Think carefully about what I just said for a second, right? And these are, now you say online degrees, these are online credentials, so you can get online, this is a new landscape. People are hiring, Walmart, IBM, they're all folks doing, these are in courses, uh, you know, in financial management, in developmental economics. The biggest, most popular one was in supply chain management. You know, all this is going on. But here's the thing, see what's happened over here. What you have done, and this is a new world, you're saying, look, you don't have to get admitted to an institution in order to learn. These courses are there. If you want to learn, go have at it. 
peculiar thing background. If you want a particular kind of credential, if you want a terminal degree for, uh, from MIT Masters or from uh, American Institute of Cairo in Economics, you go do that one semester. So that's like quarter of the cost, quarter of the time semester because they're working people. You don't have to go there. That's the world you are going into. And then you say that, look, or I get, or sometimes I don't want the terminal degree because guess what? The marketplace is also saying you get these online credentials. This is what I want. I will hire you, you know, because I can see that you're qualified. And there is a very important thing over here. This is not just a, uh, you know, the, in the Aragara, I mean, these are MIT courses on there. These are well-qualified courses. They go through all the rigor and process of this. So here's, that's the world we are talking, that dissociation, that aggregation, 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 boundaries. And uh, uh, this is, so what I've been talking about, this, this journey that I walked you through, perhaps somewhat tediously, is to point out there's a new landscape of learning which is informed by technology, by learning science, by open education. And if I were to say, let's, we are all collected here as futurists, collectively planning the future of education, let's, here are some design considerations that I hope you have abstracted from all the, from the examples that I've given. The first one, is an obvious one. And I say Yogi Berra for all of us who, you know, is often quoted for all of us who are Americans who come from or all of their, you know, famous baseball player is quoted more in management science than most, most management scientists. And he had this line which said, the future ain't what it used to be. Implication, it, there is change. It's constantly change, not in terms of the demand side alone, but in terms of what we have as new affordance of technology, science, research, right? So, and the, so the future is fluid, and it, not only in terms of creating readiness and competences for the new economy, and the point to remember over here, the implication of the future fluidity is that learning is not for the class, for the six months, for the degree, it is for life, okay? It's continuous, agile learning for life, right? The second thing is disruptive innovation. That's what I've tried to do. Your courses are different, credentials are different across the learning life cycle. But there is a caution, and this is particularly for us, those of us who are actually professional educators. We do sometimes rush and say, we've got to innovate, we've got to do this. It's very important to recognize, we like to say at MIT that we want to focus on the invariance of good learning. MIT has a very large focus on active learning, hands-on learning. We use terms like minds-on, hands-on. To, to learn is to do, right? That's an invariant. It might express itself differently because of the context that we have, new technologies that we have, but that's an outcome that we want. And so to remember that we want to be, take advantage of innovative possibilities, but we want to be mindful of the invariants that we want to keep. So that's the second takeaway. The third thing, and I'm extremely passionate about this piece, having worked with Open, is about all learners everywhere. This is not, in India we have an expression, you know, when I was working as an advisor to the National Knowledge Commission, your aim should not be to just address the creamy layer, because they already got what they got. There's a whole bunch of people who need to get, and I'm not saying this in a condescending way. We have, we were talking earlier before this meeting, there are people who are displaced, not because of a crisis, who are not displaced just because of the location, but because of their vocation. I'm in a job, that job is changing, I want to move to a different job. I'm vocationally displaced, right? So how do I go from where I am to where I need to go? So, um, how do I get to the people that I've not been able to get? So how do I do different things for many kinds of people so that people, learners, who have perennially been in the realm of the underserved can be moved up? So it's, this is not just about raising the ceiling, but raising the floor. So, for, you know, so that equity is a very, very, and equity is a non-trivial thing. It is doing many things for many people, right? And, and now, we do have the affordances to address that problem in different ways. We are learning about how people learn differently. We are learning about different skills. We have technology that allows sporting of people and experiences. COVID taught us that. 
COVID said, you can do virtual cohorts, you can do virtual internships, you don't have to go there. And COVID also taught us, which is the last point over here, that we don't have to do it all ourselves. There's an ecosystem we can leverage. There was a very interesting discussion when we were planning for open learning at MIT. Uh, Tom Malone, who runs the Center for Collective Intelligence, he said, look guys, uh, you know, I know we, you know, we were in task force and, uh, and he says, we care about hands-on learning. Again, I'm caricaturing this, hands-on learning, but that doesn't mean that we have to do it. That experience, maybe that industry, that workshop over there can provide it better. We don't have to lose our interest in providing that, but how can we leverage the ecosystem to do that? You know? And now we, we work with the industry, with partners, in order to provide different kinds of experiences. Sometimes we say, those kinds of courses go do over there. I have, I'm doing a serious calculus course in MIT, and I said, oh, I don't have basic calculus. I say, oh, you know, Khan Academy has this courses. Go do that part and come back over here. There's an ecosystem available there in order to provide different kinds of things. You know? So that, I think, that's the thing. And that's the new, shall I say, the new world education order. And I promise this, when we talk about the new world order, for me, this is very, very important. What you're saying is that what technology, open learning science is doing is really allowing you to change the structural relationship between things that we thought before were immutable. Just like with the MicroMasters, we thought you had to be admitted to an institution to learn. I said, well, not really. We thought that credentials, learners, all these relationships are, you know, and this big lesson we learned, uh, Sir John Daniels, he was, uh, he was Vice Chancellor of UK's Open University, very big force in Open, and I remember he said that uh, earlier on when we were giving talks, you know, he would talk about access, cost, and quality. The general thinking was that if you really increased access, quality will go down. A lot of our institutions, you know, so that's a small classes we need, et cetera, et cetera. But the thinking, thinking was also that if you increase quality, cost will go proportionately high, you know, or even disproportionately high. And what open education showed us, and in fact, I was involved in a project with the Gates Foundation, that you can actually have great access, great quality, without a proportionate increase in cost. It can be a scaling drawing, open resources are available. You don't have to build everything yourself. There are things. So these structural relations that we thought, he used to call it the iron triangle. These structural relationships that we thought were immutable are indeed mutable, and that's what we want to leverage, and this brings me to what we do at the Jamil World Education Lab. We say, we got these forces, but this stuff is not going to happen by magic. We got to create projects, we have got to create institutional capabilities, inst individual capabilities, institutional capacity, in order, to in order to create the enablements for change. We work with institutions in pre-K through 12 education, higher education, we, we draw upon MIT's innovations, MIT technologies. We convene communities, collaborators like ASM to work with them to, to bring these transformational changes at their institutions with the hope that there is impact so that this kind of new thinking, the new landscape becomes everyone's possibility. That's my Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vijay Kumar, for that brilliant, <laughs> brilliant um, you know, talk. It was insightful, inspiring, thought-provoking, um, definitely future-focused, lots to think about, lots of buzzwords, um, lots of new ideas, uh, but based, obviously, on the wealth of experience that he has um, and, you know, MIT to power you up. Um, and all those various institutions, so thank you. My pleasure. Um, may I now invite our illustrious U.S. Consul General um, to Morocco, Laurence T. Randolph, to give a few words. Stand. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm no, I think you want to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> Preeti, I think you have to sit down. Sit down, okay.
Is that okay? Sure. Uh, my knees aren't great, so it's going to take a while. <laughs> Hi. Um, so yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, it was such an honor to listen to you, um, not only because you're living in my hometown, Boston, so the greatest city in the United States. Of course. Um, <laughs> I had to throw that in there. Um, but also because of like the brilliant and innovative work that you're doing, and also the collaboration that you're bringing um, to Morocco. Um, so thinking about um, Priti and Dr. Asato and all of the teachers and administrators and students and parents and all of the energy that went behind bringing you here and bringing this kind of collaboration here. It's just really phenomenal. So thank it's you. Thank you all for your work. Um, um, just to kind of put things in a little bit broader of a context, right? I mean, you know, Morocco and the United States have had a very long relationship. I think most of you know that Morocco was the first country to recognize the newly independent United States. <laughs> um, we also have our oldest diplomatic building here mm. um, in Morocco and Tangier. If you ever have the opportunity, you should visit the American legation. It's still there as kind of a symbol of our relationship and the 200 years of history that we've had between our countries. Um, before COVID, there were over 450,000 Americans who visited Morocco, making it the most visited country on the continent. Mm -hmm. So there are all kinds of natural lin linkages between the United States and Morocco. Um, it's also like, as you know, I don't have to say that to anyone in this room, a very, it's like an, for, I think for many American and Western companies, it's a very good entry point for Africa. They're so, Morocco is such a player on the African continent and so well plugged in with everything that's going on the continent. It's really um, a place where people can first stop and then on to other kind of countries on the continent. So it's a really good, I think, gateway um, to further work in Africa. You all are already doing other work in Africa, but for those who aren't, it's also a good gateway. So um, just given all that historical context and thinking about today, I mean, today is another big day in our relationship. Not only because we have our Secretary of State here um, um, in Rabat having uh, meetings, um, I got to spend some time with him this morning and it was a huge honor to kind of be a part of those conversations. Um, but also because we're launching this in huge initiative between MIT um, and uh, the American School in Marrakesh. And really I think the work that, it's, I think you have done all this work to launch this and you can't always see what it will bring, right? Because you launch something today and it's going to have implications that we, none of us can imagine, right? Um, but just to share my own story, right? Like I'm from Boston, from Dorchester. Mm -hmm. I think you know Dorchester mm -hmm. pretty well. Um, so from the city, from the inner city, and I had the opportunity um, because of someone like you all who thought to have a program and thought to be innovative and creative, they established a program where we could study in southern Mexico, in Oaxaca. Mm. Um, and it was for me a really life-changing experience to kind of go have an experience outside of my com comfort zone, have engagements and conversations with people that didn't speak my language, that had a very different way of thinking about things. It really pushed me in a new way. And I think this program, and it's why I'm here today as Consul General, right? It's like that kind of one converse, that kind of work that went behind that educational initiative, right? It made me think like, wow, I can really do anything I want in the world. Like mm -hmm. I can travel and do things and have conversations anywhere that I want. And the work that you all are doing here today is going to inspire the next generation of students and the next generation of uh, learners mm -hmm. um, and the future. Um, mm -hmm. So all I can say is really thank you for your work. Thank you for the energy that you put behind it. It's not in vain. Um, generations of children are going to benefit from it. And um, mm -hmm. bravo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for those endearing words. Um, we really love having you in Morocco, not only because of your professional and diplomatic work, but you've really touched the hearts of so many Moroccans. Um, and we really uh, think you're one of the best. Um, may I now invite uh, uh, ASM student Jad Kadiri um, to uh, <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> What's my job? Good question. What's my job? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> students have worked very hard, they've been researching, they've been working on MIT projects, they've been researching MIT, the j -Well Foundation, the future of education, um, and a lot of them have come up with a lot of questions. We've invited two oh. student volunteers uh, to come forward and ask um, Dr. Vijay Kumar and, in fact, the MIT team present here, Claudia, Kirky, Joe um, and Emily, Emily and Joe, um, some questions. So I may, may I request Anissa if you would like to step forward first and then John? Come, please come. This, this is the part when I get nervous. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, my pleasure. It was a really good lecture. Yeah. You were there yesterday, right? Yes, I, I showed you the micro bits. Correct, yeah, the micro bits you showed me, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Would you mind if I ask you some questions? Not at all. So considering the effects of COVID-19 and the pandemic, and how much of the instruction has moved online? To what extent have the actual effects of online education been studied? And have there been comprehensive learning impact studies on the students, on their social and emotional growth while isolated? Or to what extent there might be a balance found between online and traditional educational frameworks? Well, uh, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but you touched, uh, th there's a slide that I have, but you touched uh, some very important points in your question. And uh, I'm not surprised because you uh, folks are actually the customers in this. You know, you're experiencing this. Uh, there are studies going on. Okay, there are various studies at MIT about online education. In fact, we conducted one because of the last two years, you know, and uh, we, one of our uh, uh, folks, Megan, she worked with some students to do a student survey. There was a piece written in Inside Higher Ed that I'll tell you, you know, which captures uh, some of the student experiences. But between the studies and between what the popular press has also reported, places like the New York Times, you know, which have done, some things become very, very apparent, you know, which is that we did with the best of intent as educators. So educators in the large did a great job of transitioning. It was difficult. They said business continuity, we can't have these kids not studying and so on. So they moved stuff online. That's a good news. The not so good news was that we also became aware that we were not terribly well prepared for this for a variety of reasons. When I say we, this is a collective we. This is not just education institutions. What it surfaced was why people came to school, for instance, was for a lot of group emotional support. There were kids also who came to school because they had to eat there, right? There are kids who could not come, uh, who came to school because their home environments were not conducive to learning. So just going online, like I said before, might have been a necessary step. It was not a sufficient step. It, it, is, it brought up all these dimensions of what that learning thing is about. You know? It's about social emotional learning. It's about contact. Okay. But it also brought out, so people came up with some intermediate solutions. You might have heard that people had pods, right? So they said, how can we have places where people can go to for that collective experience without going to the institution? You know? So there were all kinds of makeshift arrangements. We also found out, and this, this is, I'm reflecting some of the studies, that, and this part we know well, that's why we do what we do which is, uh, which when I say we, which is this MIT jail, that teachers okay, needed many more capabilities to do online education effectively. It was not a matter of transplanting this over there. They need to, and we had to work with them to learn things about how can we do the kind hands-on experiences online, how can we do interaction better on this thing, so that, uh, uh, that the entire system was working that way, but it sort of thought that this is a problem we'll get to later on. And what COVID said, that there's no later on now. It's now, you know, and it raised that thing. So I hope, so there are studies going on. 
we have to do. I mean, you just nailed it. There's much more to be done, but but it and I'm you know in a this is a very dark way of saying it, but in some sense you know it was nature's way of saying wake up. There's much more about learning you need to learn, you know, and so. Oh, uh, yeah, I have another question. Thank you, Thank you. First of all, it was, lis it was lovely listening to you, I have to say. I bet you say that to all the people. No, no, no. <laughs> You're only the third today. So. <laughs> it's fine. It's good. So, uh, I, it's really interesting that you talk about demographics and girls and, and women. I think it's really important, especially in third world countries, where, you know, the access to education is very limited. But... In terms of the United States and first world countries, uh, it's a very interesting shift there is where men and women are, like, there's a difference where there's a split. About 60 to 40% women and female to male ratio are accepted in colleges. And there's a big shift, especially online, uh, and specifically men who are deciding to stay out of college and deciding to go a more, let's say, going away from traditional roots and uh, starting working and because of student loan debt, you know, four years is apparently a lot of time. And what do you think uh, started this trend? And is there a solution to this or are they right in what you're saying? Great question. And the latter part is the easier one for me to answer, not just because of optimism, because of the kinds of things that there are alternate pathways, right? Mm -hmm. And which means that you can get educated, get professional capabilities, without going through uh, a four-year experience, if you we take that as a tradition. So the fact that we have alternatives now uh, is the good news. And there are two uh, uh, you know, angles to this. One, that uh, it, we, traditional institutions, really, I mean, you uh, have to rethink, okay, in very, very focused ways, what is it that they can offer, okay? that will add to value to all kinds of online experiences that people will get to in any way. So you have to start focusing on what is it that, I'll, what's the value added that I'll bring for why people come over here? What are the special things that I can do that they can't do uh, online? And you know, we were having this conversation even before. I'll tell you, not that I was prescient or anything, uh, before coming to MIT, I was at Mount Holyoke College, okay, which is a women's college, right? And I was talking about, I mean, I had just conjectured and got written about in the press saying, uh, if uh, I was sort of speculating that people could log on to a course from anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world. And the question that the reporter said was, you know, Vijay says that if that's the case, what will colleges offer? Now that question is very, very uh, uh, real. So the fact that people can have access to learning opportunities of different kinds is the good news uh, department. More and more people who are traditionally left out of an educational learning experience can get to. Everyone, you don't have to whack everything with the same hammer. Okay? You don't have to say that in order to get a job, in order to get prepared for the job, you have to go through a four, four year learning experience. And you're very right. I mean, the. Uh, why we got into open education, uh, and uh, uh, or, uh, at least my whole thing was because the costs of formal education were very prohibitive, and, and in, in the United States too. And despite the fact that there was a lot, there were Pell Grants and this, you know, I, was, I remember doing a, a, some work, you know, with the, the Lumina Foundation, and finding out that there's lots of people are willing to give to enable, but the people who needed those resources couldn't get to it. So it pointed out the fact that even with largest in with resources, people who needed information about financial aid loans, etc., were not able to get to it. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. So what the current situation has done is smoked out a lot of this and said, look, you don't have to go through, four, I'm, I'm giving yeah. broad general line, you don't have to go through a four-year experience in order to get a job. Yeah. A four-year experience might not be the right way to get a job. We have uh, David Otter is a well-known economist who works at MIT. He's also done studies which say that higher education, future learning, earning potential improves. So if you look at you know, why people might go to college, it might not be to get entry jobs, but later on, you know, 
there might be uh, earning implications. So there are all kinds of problem areas in terms of equipping the future workforce, not just in terms of new competencies, but making the, sure that the kind of agile learning experiences that you need to provide, because people will be much more migratory between jobs, between things, you can do now. It's a very good question. You know, may I say one thing? You folks, and this is to you also, you folks should research some of this. You know, I mean, there is the internet, there are studies going on, because not many people think about the questions the way you're asking them. So position that as your question, and just take a chunk of it and say, what research can I do that will inform this, you know, in your own community? Talking about equal... Um, yes. Come talk about equal opportunities. <laughs> so, given the very impressive career you've had and what you've told us about, you know, sometimes going beyond your goal, you know, when you had that project you had to do and you decided to go on another branch. So, what have you learned in your career about the way education changes and the reasons which provoke these changes, what do you think could happen in the near or further future? Uh, I wish, I mean, I, I, I told you, remember? I'm a futurist, I don't predict <laughs> Great capabilities. So, so uh, I, I know what I'd like to see happen. I'd like to see uh, uh, more people enjoying the fruits of learning, right? Much, many, many more people, you know. Uh, we were talking, uh, you know, uh, Preeti and I yesterday about how, for instance, India, you know, you know there are people, uh, my father had a driver, you know, and uh, when my father passed away, uh, you know, I wanted to give, he said, no, don't worry about me, you know, can you just fund my daughter's education? Okay, they're just invested in making sure, you know, that uh, there's that. So we want, when there is so much interest, and when people see such a direct line, between learning opportunities, education, and social capital, mobility, economic mobility, social mobility. I think it is our business as educators to create the opportunities for them, okay? Then for those people who have the opportunity, we want to make sure that we create the kinds of things that will equip them for a changing world, you know? So I believe that the future that I see is really, and this is not being Pollyannish about it, having, you know, some wild optimism, but, uh, I really see, uh, you know, here is someone like Preeti who says, let's do this project. I see that the general interest of Muhammad Jamil says, let's s s launch a lab so that we can make these possibilities widely available around the, uh, the world. I really think that the intent, the capabilities, the affordances for meeting, having much more inclusive, education, much more equity in education is there and it's happening. And it's your business to make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I'd like to thank our students. They did a great job. I mean, they did. The was involved. They did a really good job and lots to think about. May I now, I know we're running very over time. I mean, I think uh, we're sort of uh, like way over the limit. But do you think that you feel like answering a few questions of from our pretty audience? Pretty, my colleagues will tell you. I mean, this is <laughs> this is why I live. <laughs> so maybe just open it out for a few questions from the audience. Um, please don't be shy. This is a chance to hear it from the experts. We have uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar. I'm sure Claudia's uh, yes. will be happy to answer questions. Perky. Emily, Joe, all the people who are working with our kids. I have a question. Are you, uh, have, you been, have you worked with other high school levels all over the world? Or is this something, this is relatively new? Because I usually think of MIT with college or master's or PhD level. But this kind of learning right. to a lower level is not, is not you, you are a higher level education. So is this something? It's a very good question and it's a good thing Claudia is there. I'll give you one. <laughs> I'll give you one example, then I'm, I'll pass on to her. Maybe you won't. So uh, uh, th there's a project that we just concluded, which got the UNESCO Award for the best ICT project in education. It was done uh, with the Tata Foundation, the Tata Trust in India. 1,100 
schools in rural areas. I was a PI, We're very proud of the project. 1100 schools, Kirky was uh, uh, also part of the project team. And 1100 schools in uh, science, math, education, grades eight through 12, right? And uh, uh, we reached about 800 of them. And this was, you know, government schools in rural areas, four states, uh, Chhattisgarh, Rajasthan, Telangana, and Mizoram, right? And, uh, it, and it's very interesting, just as a point, and I'll point, because this is Claudia's life, so I'll point. But uh, even there, I remember the early conversations, and people say, oh, MIT, technology. And say, boop, boop. Technology, yes, but we're really talking about active learning, that you move away, because India has done some remarkable work. You know, they have the NCRT with the curriculum and stuff, but it was rote learning, we wanted to move to, you know, so that people are prepared to do these kinds of things. So yes, we have, and we've been working with several schools over the years, but uh, Claudia, and you know, your most recent project. Yeah, I mean, I think MIT has had um, education and sort of impact education and technology has been the same place where we extend what we know about education. So I've done it as a student, as a researcher. I would say in the last eight years, we have formally more intention. We did the task force for the future of education of MIT students. And when we asked our community, our staff, everyone, there are several recommendations on what MIT needs to do because it could impact their education before students get to MIT. So we don't have a school of education, but many, many programs. So our World Education Lab formally works with you know, K-12 students. And I would say in the last two years, even with the pandemic, high school became a priority for us, not for outreach, which is a lot of what happened at MIT. You know, we want you know, different schools extend what they do to K-12, to but then high school is that moment where the students are making decisions, not just to come to MIT, but even to the question of uh, underserved or minorities, we want to make sure that those students are applying to MIT. But with with pandemic, um, I think the voice of the students, um, you know, for an education that should be relevant, that prepares them for future jobs, that you know, in the case of women, prepare them to make a difference in the world. So some of the insights that I have um, in terms of high school. Uh, especially for public schools that, you know, in everywhere even in the U.S. speak for what the students want. The students are, in average, exposed to only 10 careers that are traditional, and the prediction is that they will disappear with AI. So what we know is that we need to expose the students to many more careers uh, that they need to enter. So there are lots of information about you know, Belize. 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 Your Belize. wonderful Belize yeah, so project. We, we are doing, uh, we're working with the Ministry of Education in Belize, uh, in Central America. It's been two years and a half. Uh, I think some of the points that BJ made in terms of activating the system. So we have been working with, you know, um, the system in general, like, you know, what are the companies expecting, you know, um, um, you know, what is happening with the students, what aspirations, what are the families looking for, how is the education system preparing for change. So we are uh, helping the education system create a experimental school. school. How many kids? Uh, it will be 300 when the school is fully operational. Um, uh, so we'll start with, you know, ninth grade. Uh, opening the school, but you know, all of us here are involved in that project, including BJ, bringing many perspectives. So, what are the jobs? Uh, what are the skills? So, creating new frameworks. Some of the curriculum that we have brought to ASM is the curriculum that we're hoping to integrate uh, in the country. So, mm -hmm. even this uh, project in Spain with the uh, Zara family owner, they have mm -hmm. a foundation, Ortega family. Ortega, so yeah. in the did. context of oh, the good pandemic, for you. it took 600 uh, kids. Another, yeah. Yeah. yeah, another project, um, again, with different perspectives. So, a lot of the high school insights that we have are really the students that came to us are not, um, you know, are academically well prepared but they were not as exposed to many careers. So part of what we did to your question was that open, you know, sort of online learning is not 
just one thing. So one of the things that we tried to do was demonstrate that online learning can be engaging, can be uh, you know collaborative, can involve making things, creating things. So we had 600 students working with 60 mentors. Uh, they came from 25 universities in the U.S. They were all over the world because they were living at home. Uh, but we had a really um, incredible put off the, uh, program yeah. that we actually um, replicated with, uh, with the So those 25 students. professors in the States would give a, 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 a lecture? There right were 60, 60 mentors that were and they would then freshmen, the from freshmen to graduate, um, mm -hmm. you know, graduate students from mm -hmm. different colleges. So we prepared them, or, you know, our team the team here, the we prepared them, they got boxes like the ASM students got boxes. So Part of what we learned from that program uh, was that the students need mentors, they need communities, they really had um, sort of a collaborative experience, but they feel better prepared for college and they were actually exposed to different careers. To my point that I made earlier, uh, which is an ODC report from countries that have taken PISA. So those are the things that we learned that, you know, they were now considering all, you know other options that were not in traditional careers so anyway, lots, lots of experience in high school for us yeah yes yeah. It, it, it was interesting when we started uh, this uh, what we found was that uh, 120 initiatives at mit working with schools and we said can we cohere them together and that's how the whole pre-k through 12 initiative yeah, you know one thing that i mentioned uh, forgot to mention is that mit students are very interested in so Joe there has taken a, a certificate program where he was a student to teach. So MIT offers um, a step, yeah, certificate so to prepare students that want to teach in you know, K-12 schools. And um, so it's a program that continued to exist. So Joe went through that program and has, does have the And he survived. <laughs> <laughs> May, may I take any other questions, or should I just go on to one of the online questions? Absolutely, please. Um, so just one. Um, so this whole process of partnering with you know, JWell, MIT, and ASM, at which point will you feel that this has been a success and that it's been a transformative experience for our kids, for the parents, for the teachers, for which you're doing you know, uh, professional development? At which point can we say, that um, this is a success, and how long will it take? So this is, uh, you all remember this famous uh, uh, Michelangelo line, you know, this, the Sistine Chapel, you know? When, <laughs> when will it be finished, and says when, it, when it's done, you know? <laughs> so, but... Uh, <laughs> He's leaving it a year. <laughs> but, uh, but there is, uh, it's, this is an important question. There are two or three things, and I really, uh, and I'm not going, I'm not, I won't be flip about it. Uh, there is a thing that we say, you know, at MIT when we're engaging in a lot of educational technology-based innovation, we had a group from the National Science Foundation, et cetera, who came and said, how do you know this is making a difference, right? Mm -hmm. Now, and I'm going to give two or three things just as indicators. I sort of quipped at that time. I said, look, the quality of the discourse has changed. There are faculty who are talking about teaching and learning at MIT. The stereotypical impression of MIT that is that it's a research institution. But we have our faculty care passionately about teaching, and they're talking about what's going on with their students in the classes. And I've seen this, you know, Hong Kong, I was telling you. Um, there are things that we, where, that we bring, you know, when you talk about active learning. There is the lingua franca, you know, of, uh, of education discourse in the school, is, includes things like the kinds of concepts that we're introducing, hands-on, minds-on, etc. So when the, you know that you have had impact when people are talking about, when your students, you know, talk about their experience of the work that's going on with these projects. And I already heard it today. It gives me great joy when they talk about, hey, yeah, you were there with the micro bits thing, yes, you know, I saw that. So that's one kind of an indicator, and it's not, the success checkbox kind of metric, but it's a very important thing because then you know change has genuinely happened. Uh, we had an ex-president of India, Abdul Kalam, you know, and uh, Abdul Kalam Azad, and what he would say is, you know that you have succeeded as a teacher 
when you bring a smile to the child's face. You know? I mean, it was, it, was a, you know, it was a simple thing, but it's a, it's a very important statement because a, education has to be a joyful experience. I think the indicators that you'll see, and it's a tricky question, for, and, and who, I do not know if the person uh, who asked realized how complex a question it is, because some of the things when you're changing, right, and we ran through this with the India project, it's a very complex project, your assessment systems also have to change, right? If you do the things that you're doing for change, then the things that you're measuring have also got to be changed. You are what you measure. So that's the kind of stuff that has to change. And when you talk about parents, and I can tell you this from parents, the initial reaction is, what is this? This is different. This is different from what I did, right? And you have to allow it because there is some trust that you cultivate to say that no, downstream this is like effects. And you will see it in the results in not only, and this is an uh, important statement, at MIT the Bank of uh, Boston did a study some years ago, several years ago, to look at the, uh, how our students, the success of our students. And uh, what they said was it's not about the number of jobs that MIT students got, they got their employed, but the number of jobs they created. That was a generative metric you wanted to see, right? So you want to see what are the kinds of changes your students, where they're going, what are the careers, you know? That's when you know that you've succeeded. Thank you. May I? Yes, sure. Nancy. I have a quick comment to You were talking about encouraging uh, individual innovation. And in order to encourage individual innovation, we should embrace risk-taking. And I would actually back that one step even further and say that in order to encourage risk-taking, we probably also need to redefine failure. And I would, saying, absolutely. Rather than saying that failure is trying and not succeeding, we should redefine failure as never trying to begin with. Oh, I'm so glad because, uh, thank you very much. That's a very profound statement. You know, in that in the teacher thing, that slide that the new teacher or slide that I had, there's something I wanted to point out, and this is so important when you're talking about it very quickly, and I'll get to, I know what I want to say, but I thought if it's displayed there, it might look better. So, the coach, you know, the teacher is the coach, we look at it, and that it's about the failure. A coach doesn't tell us, us you know, that not to fall down. The coach tells the learner how to pick herself up, himself up when she falls down, right? Saying, don't put your, there's a wonderful metaphor, a, a guru of mine, John C. Lee Brown, you know, big, this thing, was talk of, he would compare teaching with teaching skiing, teaching in class with teaching skiing, and then, you know, that whole image of when you fall down in your skis, how do you get up, how do you stand up, put that ski, you know, there's a way, there's a mechanics to that, right? So, uh, I think that's the thing, it, it is, and we talk about constructive bugs, there's a whole notion of constructive bugs. Uh, your guru and they, in, the, in the media lab, in the AI, Minsky, and they're all, there's a whole s session on failing, you know, failing as success and how do, you, how do you bring them failure. That's a very important statement, you know. Uh, and that's why we talk about formative assessment. Now the thing about that is, we, when we studied, we waited for six months. Yeah, and the point of exams was to eliminate people and now we do formative systems so that we correct and give them feedback to improve, you know. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. May I now invite uh, Dr. Asato for his closing comments? Please. Okay. Just want to say uh, thank you. Oh, I? <laughs> I will obey. <laughs> uh, I just want to say thank you so much for your, your generosity of your, of your time. Huh and sharing your, your ex expertise with us, our entire community here. Um, again, we have students, we have uh, mm -hmm. distinguished guests, we've got parents, board members, faculty and staff who have joined us here today. And, I, and the in numerous uh, people who are joining us online, live uh, at Facebook, at ASM's web, uh, webpage. And uh, on behalf of the entire uh, ASM community, just wanted to say thank you for, for your time and for sharing with us today. It, it truly, um, we know um, how fortunate we are uh, to be in your presence and with your team's presence here uh, from the States. Um, and we look forward to the collaboration in the coming years 
and the exciting projects that will be held uh, this week with our students in the middle school and elementary school uh, tomorrow and Friday as well. So thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. This is a, a small token. Uh, Ooh. Right. If this is small, I wonder what a bigger Thank you very much. And I do also want to say again, thank you to uh, Mrs. Pretty Paul Kadiri and the Kadiri family for opening up their beautiful home. <laughs> and for her very positive leadership uh, of the PTO for over the past two years and, and her great generosity and the family's great generosity to the ASM community. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And now let's have some dance. <laughs> 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 uh, please, Dr. Kamar, the MIT team is here.